Dr. Badros has published on this, so he's really anxious to answer this question. Um, but I want to I want to bring up uh, he and I, I, he's got personal experience, but I want to tell you what the uh, transplant registry shows for racial disparities. So uh, and I want to focus specifically on transplant. He's going to talk about the other issue, I think. So we've we've already told you that there's 36 or 34,000 in 2017 myeloma patients. And he also showed you data that 9,000 patients a year about get transplants. He made the point that 50% of those 34,000 are over 70, which is true. So there's 17,000 patients under 70, but only 9,000 transplants. That means less than half of the, or about half, of the people who are transplant eligible are getting transplants, okay? Because the doctors, in general, it's the doctors don't refer them. It's not that the academic centers won't transplant them. The doctors don't refer them or the patients don't want to go or they don't have access, which is a big problem. And, but the, the, that's in, when I give you the data of 50%, that's in general. The Caucasian rate is about 60% of the Caucasians get transplanted. The African American rate, because we've done studies on this, is in the 35 percent range, and the Hispanic rate is 20 percent. So there is huge disparities on who gets referred to transplant centers. That being stated, if you get a transplant, your outcomes are exactly the same regardless of your racial background. Um, you know, being in Baltimore, uh, we have a lot of African American patients. So. We just published our data about two years ago. We looked at all our African-American patients, and I can tell you the conclusions. On um, presentation, African-Americans, or blacks in general, are 10 years younger. The median age is 10 years younger than Caucasians. So if the median age for Caucasians is 69, uh, the African-Americans are 59. Um, that's number one. Number two, the delay of referral. We have noticed that African American get referred to a transplant center at a lower rate. So if we talked about transplant in the first 12 months, that is definitely delayed in African American. The third point, and I don't, you know, we published that so it's available for specifics, but the third interesting point is multiple myeloma outcomes in African American is better than Caucasians. So whether that's because they present in younger age or um, they have delay, even if they have delayed transplant, their outcome is similar, uh, but they have better outcome. And there is some studies to suggest that they have favorable cytogenetics. We just uh, actually had a presentation in ASH uh, last year looking at fish analysis in African American and Caucasians. They have less deletion 17. They have more favorable favorable signatures like 11, 14. Um, and uh, the myeloma, as you all know, is not a hereditary disease, but we have noted clusters in families. And African Americans have high clusters of multiple myeloma. So we always recommend that if the patient has a family member when their children reach age 40 or they have siblings, they should be checked for multiple myeloma because the clusters is, is higher. So they are younger, they are they referred later, but they have good outcome. This is, by the way, the only cancer where African-American outcomes are better than Caucasians uh, biologically. Okay, so the other qu part of your question is about alternate therapies. So you're, you're, sitting, uh, you're, you're sitting in, f in the audience of three people who are medically researched inclined uh, physicians, and unless you can prove something works in general, we don't accept it as fact. There have been no studies that really are convincing that any exercise, any support group, any diet actually impacts directly on the outcome of patients with myeloma. That being said, um, my colleagues will probably agree, the patients, 80% of the patients, almost 80% of the patients do alternate therapies, whether we agree to it or not. And I personally don't object the only objection I have, as I mentioned before, about calcium in people newly diagnosed, the only therapy that actually looks like there might be some scientific basis for it, I hate to do this, is turmeric. Um, there, are some, there are some studies from Australia and one from MD Anderson in Houston 
that indicate that turmeric may have some anti-myeloma efficacy. No one knows the dose, how long to take it, or anything like that. Maybe. So if you said, I really have to do something besides take your drugs, I'd say, well, you could probably do turmeric. So the only thing that I would add is, um, and this may be more global to cancer in general than to myeloma, but there is this whole question of what the tumor microenvironment is causing and how it's contributing to the cancer. And one thing that's also clear is that there is uh, a higher incidence of myeloma as your BMI increases. So fat and the chronic inflammatory conditions associated with that contribute. And I actually was um, at a lecture looking at incidents and outcomes of patients with head and neck cancer where they show that there are markers of inflammation that can be determined and actually those markers are very similar to some markers that we see in the bone microenvironment and myeloma. And, that, and this was done through a nurse and a physician cohort study, so these were tens of thousands of people, that patients that were on anti-inflammatory agents such as uh, an aspirin um, were able to lower these markers and actually had better outcomes. Now this has never been tested in myeloma, but there's a lot of reasons to think that people should be on an aspirin. Certainly a lot of our agents can increase the risk of clots. And so I think these are things that can be done that may incrementally improve outcomes, although I will say that the data in myeloma is, is not there. Just one more comment, a cautionary one. Patients on Velcade and, uh, for example, if they take high doses of green tea, we know that those patients can antagonize the effect of Velcade. So there are some substances, especially high doses of antioxidants, like vitamin C, should not be used, for example, around transplant. So uh, alternative medicines, maybe there is some benefit like turmeric, but there is a lot of issues that we don't know, and some of them can be harmful, can antagonize the effect of treatment. So I always recommend to stop treatment with alternatives, at least during induction and transplant. There is one international effort, I believe, in uh, Iceland. Okay. Uh, the International Myeloma Working Group is actually screening everybody on this island uh, for myeloma. So I think thousands of patients are donating samples and they are being followed. I just want to mention that MGAS, or monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, affects about 5% of the population over age 50. And the problem with the data that David mentioned is that really it doesn't reflect the actual incidence of what we consider smoldering. We don't have a good incidence for that. We have incidence from people that report myeloma to the registry. But if you don't report MGAS and you don't report MGAS, we know the 5% incidence from studies done by Dr. Kyle from Rochester, where he came and screened 25,000 people. So if you do screening, I think you will find that. And I think smoldering myeloma incidence is much higher than 500 cases a year. In my practice alone, and I don't think I'm unique, I have like at least 30 or 40 patients with smoldering myeloma I've been following for years. Uh, and some of them progress, some of them do not progress. Uh, so there is a place for new trials. Your point is very well taken. Unfortunately, the working group, as well as the ASCO recommendation, is not to screen for multiple myeloma the, with the SPEP and free light chains. That being said, uh, I think the screening is happening. We pick a lot of patients asymptomatic. And I think the subset of patients that should be screened are the people that have family history, first degree family history. So actually along those lines, uh, we together with Dana Farber just got a grant and actually Jenny's involved in this, where we're specifically starting a screening process of 50,000 uh, individuals that are either going to be African Americans in general, so basically anybody that walks into the cancer center that may be accompanying somebody else that is just there as a friend or whatever, as well as first degree relatives to begin to address these issues. And I think it's becoming relevant now because as the biology of smoldering myeloma becomes better understood and as we can begin to think about potentially therapeutic intervention trials, there, there is a, a relevance to this, but certainly we're going to have to screen a lot of people to come up with a few numbers, and it's unclear what we're going to do, what we would have been able to do, and what we will be doing in the future with this. But I, I actually believe that if there's a, an area that we can impact in terms of curing of the disease, it's certainly at these early stages before it develops into full fledged myeloma. So, IGH is a heavy chain of the immunoglobulin that is normally found on chromosome 14. And MAF is an oncogene that's normally found on chromosome 4. 
if I remember correctly. So is that right? Is it four or is it 16? Uh, no, maps are 16? 16, sorry, 16. So that would be a 14, 16 translocation. That has nothing to do with your immunoglobin type. That, that has no, it's, that's your genetic makeup of your myeloma. That has nothing to do with your immunoglobin or light chain. They're separate. Even though IgH is called immunoglobulin heavy, so yep. even though MGA, I mean, IgH is called immunoglobulin heavy chain, it has nothing to do with the lambda light chain. Correct. It has nothing to do with the, with the paraprotein, the type of protein your myeloma makes. That has to do with the genetic makeup of your myeloma cells, not what, what protein they're making. <laughs> How many transplants can a person do? That's a great question. So I think the most transplants, I think it was way after Ashraf was in Arkansas, we had a guy who had at least six transplants. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, he lives like 15 years, and you, you don't know Dr. Barlagi, so that's why Ashraf won't be surprised. But, but um, he had at least six transplants. Um, so the concept of two transplants was one. I was showing you that that was, it's debatable, and I actually generally agree with Dr. Badros's interpretation that, that there are differences between how the U.S. study was ran and how the European study was run, because in the European study, they never got revelment for their first part of their treatment regimen, where in the U.S., almost 70% of the patients had Revlimid. We think that was the difference between the two trials, is they didn't get optimal therapy. So when they did a second transplant, they overcame the fact that they didn't get the Revlimid up front. But there's no way to prove that. That's just a you know, hypothesis. In general, we do one transplant. I still do two transplants on people that have advanced stage disease and high-risk disease, even though I've shown you that it doesn't work. But I know the, that, that there are certainly some patients that probably benefit from that, um, not only in that study, but some other older studies as well, some of them from Europe, from uh, um, Dr. Sonnenfeld's group, that uh, two transplants may be better than one in specific subgroups of patients with high-risk disease. So the, the better question that you should be asking is, can you have another transplant later? Let's say you only have one. So all of us will usually collect enough cells to do more than two transplants. You just leave them in the freezer. And they're good forever. The cells that you have stored are good forever. And the, the issue is, is should we do a transplant? If you relapse seven years from now, should we do a transplant again? And the answer is, in general, Dr. Badros did say, I think in his presentation, that in general, you get about a year out of a second transplant. But that's because it all depends on how long the first one lasted. In general, it's about 40 or 50% the duration. So if you got seven years out of first transplant, you had another transplant, probably last you about three years after for the second one. So if you did it, if you do it, the if you want to do a third one, it's going to last a year and a half. By the fourth one, it's not worth doing. So eventually, we don't have any new drugs to use for the transplant. We're all still using the same drug. So the drugs is not going to work after a while. So it doesn't make any sense to keep doing it. So in general, <clears throat> we check. Um, our group, and I can't speak for them, but they probably do something similar. We check their myeloma numbers and their blood and their urine at two months and three months. At three months, if you don't have any evidence of protein in your blood or urine, you probably should have a bone marrow to see if you're MRD negative, if they have a test for it. Um, and then we generally just do the blood and urine tests every three months forever. And usually, it's not like your bones start falling apart when you relapse. Usually, you see a little blip in one of the numbers, and we go, oh, that doesn't look good. We repeat it again in whatever duration of time, and we tend to we see if there's a pattern of the disease coming back. So we... Pardon? Protein electrophoresis. Protein electrophoresis, yes. The protein electrophoresis, the, the uh, uh, serum protein electrophoresis, and the immunofixations. So we do those routinely. If you're in complete remission, we check them every three months. If you're a high-risk patient and we're a little bit more nervous, maybe every two months, but certainly no more often than that. So up until recently, it was very simple to kind of predict how someone was going to do time-wise. And I'm generalizing. So if you got, uh, let's say you got four years out of a transplant and then you went on, um, KRD for your first salvage regimen, and that lasted two years, and then that didn't work anymore, and you went on P 
pummeled my dexamethasone. You probably would expect to get about 12 months out of it. And when that didn't work, you put them on something else, and that's going to last six months, and it's usually half as long for each subsequent line of therapy. So once you get to like the fifth line of therapy, if you can get four to six months out of it, you're doing pretty well. So the likelihood of responding and the duration of responses go down with subsequent therapies. With some of the new combinations, particularly daratumumab, it, that, those, that, that philosophy doesn't really hold. They found that whether you're in the first, second, or third relapse, you still had the same likelihood of responding and the duration of relapse, which is actually really different than what we've seen in the past. But in, in general, yes, the more you get treated, less likely it's to work and the shorter it's going to last. Clear so answer. the recommendation is to not start treatment uh, unless patients are enrolled in clinical trials. And specifically, the clinical trials that, that in smoldering myeloma have really focused on the high risk. And I think the data that you saw in smoldering was all in the high risk smoldering in the context of a clinical trial. It definitely can become more aggressive over time. You can pick up, as we've already shown and talked about, you can pick up new genetic mutations, which may result in more resistance to drugs. But it also can change the, the way it acts. In general, myeloma only is in the bone marrow. But in some of the patients who have been treated for many, many years and through many, many treatments, sometimes they develop what we call extramedullary disease, which are masses of myeloma that are not in the bone marrow. And in a very, very small proportion, if you remember the carousel ball slide, they talked about plasma cell leukemia, which is only like 1% of myeloma patients. But sometimes it becomes so um, uh, aggressive that it gets into the bloodstream like it's a leukemia. But this is really not, doesn't happen very much, and it's almost always in patients who've had disease for many, many years and through many, many therapies. I don't want you to focus on those kind of things because it's not very common. So, so we, there's a couple of things we look for in the urine. Um, the first thing is you can look at the free light chains can spill into the urine if you have high enough free light chain burden. And it's another marker of where the disease is. The free light chain test in the serum is more sensitive than the urine. So some people say we don't have to do urines anymore, and that's not exactly true. And in fact, the guidelines, which I zipped over, says that if you're still getting Zomata, you should be getting urine tests every, every three months because the drug can affect the kidney. So we're not looking for myeloma damage. We're looking for drug damage. So even my patients, so I'm not a big fan of urines, um, but patients who are on bisphosphonates, I check their urines every six months just to make sure their kidneys are healthy. So urines are still part of the standard screening procedure, at least the first go around. And if you have a lot of urine protein, if that's your only marker, I probably would still do it. But in general, for the majority of patients, I follow their serum-free light chains. But if they're on bisphosphonates, they still do urines t at least twice a year. I can't speak for my colleagues. That's what I do. Yes, we do urine, actually. And we do urine every three months. And um, I know that people think that free light chain in the serum is good enough for the urine. However, as we started seeing more patients, there are mutations in the light chain, which means you cannot pick it up in the uh, using the monoclonal antibody that the testing we do and uh, i will venture to say although i don't have the data that african-american appears to have discrepancy between the serum and the urine we are looking into that but we don't have the data yet so we usually do 24-hour urine as part of the staging and a lot of times you have protein in the urine going up and the free light chains are unchanged and the reverse is true They, they've had the gene expression profile test for at least a year and a half, and it's just now supposed to be coming online. And I have no idea, because it was already clear, approved and everything else. They bought the company, and it's been sitting there for a year and a half. What's the test? Gene expression profile. It's another one of the tests looking for. It's a 70 gene marker to see if, uh, if you, it categorizes people into another way to categorize whether you're standard, intermediate, high risk based on gene sequencing. It was commercially available before. Company got bought. It, it was functioning completely fine. It got bought by Quest. Most of you heard of Quest. And Quest has been sitting on it for almost a year and a half. And Dr. Borello knows why, because I don't know why. Yeah. 
So the reason why it's not commercially available, at least what I've been told, is that they haven't been able to do the internal validations of the assays that they need to do to present to the FDA. So they apparently have completed that um, because we're actually using it as a randomization criteria for our current Mills trial. Um, and I've been told that I think in the next few months it should come online again. The Skyline is only part of a clinical trial right now. It's not commercially available. So if they're not in a clinical trial, they can't have it done. The um, GEP test will be commercially available again. Skyline is right now a yes or no, and it's not to be specifically not to be used for treatment decisions yet. That's what this clinical trial is about, because we're participating in it. The only problem with gene expression profiling is if you're going to use it, I think you have to use the treatment in, that was developed in Arkansas because the validation for this treatment, low, intermediate, and high risk, was done on the trials of Dr. Barlogi with total therapy. I'm not sure you can take it out from that and use it as a way to treat patients. So the only way you are at low risk if you get that specific treatment. So actually, I disagree with you. <laughs> uh, it's, no, it, it was validated. It was validated um, at the Mayo Clinic with uh, RevDex versus Dex and a few other non-total therapy-related um, studies as well. But I mean, Ashraf is right in the sense that the thousands of patients that were really used to define it and, and validate it primarily were at in Arkansas. But there is extra Arkansas validation as well.